The political highlight this week was of course the interview uh, of President Uhuru Kenyatta with the leading journalists from major media houses. I have a lot of very fascinating pointers yeah, on that very unique interview. Okay, But first, let me thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. All those people who left Mbuzis for me, Christmas Mbuzis, at Uhuru Park. <laughs> Just kidding, okay? But I think you get the message. They didn't leave it at Huru Park, uh, but they used them pesa. So thank you very much for the boozies. I received the boozies with my two hands. Almighty God, replenish your storehouses yeah, from where these uh, boozies came from. And God bless you and increase you greatly in 2019. Now on to the presidential interview. In my view, the members of the press on this one included some of our best TV interviewers, yeah. people like Hussein Mohammed of Citizen. Actually, up and coming Hussein Mohammed, because of the time, <laughs> anyway, he has really grown in leaps and bounds, and today is one of the best. That's my view. People like Ali Mwanzo from KTN, and they asked most of the right questions. Yeah. However, there was a very big problem. There was no gender balance. Now, this must have been a great embarrassment for our country, yeah, because foreigners watching this will assume that we don't have many lady journalists in our media, which is not true. Many may even assume that our lady journalists don't have the capabilities. That is also not true. Media houses, <laughs> that was a big black mark in my book, yeah, as far as you're concerned. Should have sent the ladies. Where were the ladies? Even if it was just two of them, yeah, that would have looked much better. Anyway, out of all the interviews our president has done, this must rank as the best, amongst the best, but according to me, the very best. He was relaxed and obviously very well prepared by his handlers yeah, for the questions that were going to be fired his way. Now, obviously, I'm very balanced. I try very hard to be balanced. But let me just confess, yeah, so that you judge me on that. I love the president. I just like our president. Being president <laughs> is not a bed of roses. It's a very, very challenging post hold. And considering what President Uhuru has been through, yeah, I admire him. I think he has done an excellent job yeah, under the circumstances. You know, a voter is a human being. Yeah, and as a voter, you can like a certain candidate, even if he's short on a few things. Yeah, you just like that candidate. Yeah, so that's just the way I like uh, the president. Anyway, that does not mean I will not be criticizing him on this particular video. I will. In fact, my <laughs> criticism is going to be very harsh. Okay? But even more importantly, at the end of this video, I will tell you why this particular press interview was a very significant political event. In my view, it was a sign. It was a sign of something to come. And we will come, we'll come to that at the very end, at the tail end of this video. Now, before I start firing the barbs, let me start with the things on which I agreed totally with our president. And it is on a topic that occupied most of this interview, and that is corruption. The president agreed with most Kenyans that the success of his purge against corruption will be judged on how many convictions are achieved. Yeah, not how many prosecutions. But the president feels that the judiciary is a hindrance. The judiciary, as a very important independent arm of government, yeah, is slowing down, yeah, is hindering, is in fact in some cases being an obstacle in the fight against corruption. And on that I agree with our president 1000%. The biggest problem is that our judiciary has become a kind of club, an exclusive club, whereby who you know yeah, influences the outcome of cases. Yeah. Now, this is something that we have inherited from the colonial judicial system, and the bark must stop on the desk of the Chief Justice, David Maraga. In my view, what the judiciary should have done is to have, number one, first of all, realized 
that the fight against corruption is a major, very important yeah, issue in Kenya today on which the entire future yeah, of the nation called Kenya hinges. And because of this, arrangements should have been made yeah, to speed up the hearing yeah, and uh, conclusion of corruption cases. Extra sittings late into the night yeah, would have come in. The judiciary, in my view, have done very little, if anything, to ensure that these cases are concluded quickly. Now, why is it important to conclude these cases quickly? Well, in this particular case, momentum is very important. Yeah? And clearly right now, the momentum of prosecuting corrupt people in Kenya has slowed down considerably. But there's another even bigger reason. Historically in Kenya, one of the main weapons that has been used by corruption yeah, suspects and other guilty people to defeat justice has been to slow down cases. And I'll give you a few examples. Somebody has gone and grabbed the land of a poor family somewhere in Kenya. Maybe, let's say, for example, purposes, somewhere in central province, Nyeri, yeah, or somewhere in Moranga. And so what this land grabber knows, they know very well they have the resources and they have the connections. And therefore, they ensure that the case drags on and on and on. The poor family needs funds yeah, to hire a lawyer. They also need funds to travel to Nairobi for the hearing, which in many cases is twisted so that it becomes almost like a mention. Yeah, nothing much is achieved in that particular so-called hearing. One technicality after another one is introduced, yeah, and the case drags on and on and on until this poor family uh, the main person in this poor family dies out of stress and the land grabber easily wins because at the time of the determination of the case <laughs> the other side is tired out of funds the other side has been bullied yeah, into submission and so this poor family lose their land which is rightfully theirs the golden bug saga is another excellent example how many years did the Golden Bug saga drag on in court? Was it almost 20 years? In 10 years, a lot can happen. People die. People forget. Media attention is shifted somewhere else. Public attention is shifted somewhere else. Which is of course excellent to do some funny, funny things. And you realize the case is no longer there. Either it has been thrown out of court or the guilty person has won. Now, in the current cases on corruption in court, one excellent example being the NOS cases, we have seen the same old habits creeping back. The way we are going, some of these cases will be determined in 2021. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. That will not help Kenya. However, that will definitely help. Yeah, people are guilty. It will definitely help people are accused. So it would have made a lot of sense for the judiciary to bend over backwards, yeah, to abandon tradition and go for longer hearings, yeah, hearings uh, late into the night. It would have made a lot of sense if the judiciary had deliberately gone out of, out of its way to frustrate this tactic that has been used in Kenya for decades, yeah, to frustrate justice. In 2017, Chief Justice David Maraga's judiciary made history yeah, by overturning a presidential election. The Kenyan judiciary was being talked about all over the world. Folks in many parts of the world have never believed that we have a serious judiciary in Africa. September 1st, 2017 was an eye-opener, very, very historical. However, in 2018, if we were to look for the person or the single institution that has let down Kenyans the most, then it will be difficult to defeat the judiciary <laughs> to the number one position or being the biggest letdown of the nation called Kenya. After all the praise we heaped on Ch the Chief Justice David Baraga, 
it seems something very funny, something very strange and bizarre happened. And it seems today we have a very different brother. A chief justice who is even very quick to defend his judges. Yeah. When everybody knows that these judges, some of these judges are corrupt. Now in my view, it is extremely dangerous for a chief justice to start voting for people. Very dangerous. Because what that means is that that particular judiciary is opinionated. Yeah. It means that that judiciary already has passed the verdict on cases before they arrive in court. It is totally impossible for somebody to have faith in such a judiciary. Now, in some certain instances, the president's hands are tied. Why? Because of the history he has with the judiciary. Especially after the 2017 yeah, verdict that overturned his victory. The president said things that the judiciary will always use yeah, to defend themselves from the executive. The judicial arm of government was portrayed as a victim with a lot of sympathy from the public. However, where we have reached right now, we need to open our eyes and realize that the judiciary is a big letdown in the fight against corruption. And that is the truth. If Bwana David Maraga, Chief Justice David Maraga, does not act fast to correct the situation, then I'm afraid history is going to judge him and the judiciary system very, very harshly. Now, on to what I did not agree with yeah, in this interview in terms of what the president said. And this is on national debt. Now, everybody knows debt is killing Kenya. But according to the president, we don't have a problem. Yeah? And the example he gave was Japan. According to the president, Japan, uh, the debt to GDP ratio for Japan is over 100%, while that of Kenya is only 56%. Now, let's simplify that because uh, we're not all economists, okay? GDP stands for gross domestic product. It is what the country generates. And let us simplify it even further to understand why this comparison, yeah, this uh, comparing the ratio of what you're borrowing with your production, why it's important. Let's simplify it further and talk about an individual. What this means is that if Japan was an individual, yeah, uh, it earns, let's say, a salary of $100,000 a month. And its debt obligation is over 100000 a month. Now, obviously, that doesn't make sense, at least at first sight. You can't be paying more than uh, what you're earning. But let's move away from an individual who's employed to somebody who's in business. Let's say the real estate business so that we understand this better. So you have several apartments coming up in prime areas of Nairobi. You have obviously borrowed to put up these apartments. And at first sight, it may look like you've overborrowed. Yeah, because what you're earning compared to what you owe doesn't make sense. You owe much, much more yeah, than what you're already generating from your real estate projects. However, when introduce a document called a cash flow projection, it starts to make sense because flat A and flat B are going to be complete in six months. So revenue is going to start coming in so fast at that particular time that you're going to be able to comfortably service all your debts. Your current assets, yeah, the land on which those flats are built, if you look at it, is huge. Yeah? So when you compare your assets to the money you owe, this is the reason why the banks have given you the loan in the first place. They know that if you default, they're comfortable. Yeah? They'll be able to auction your land, your unfinished flats. So they're, very, they're, not, they're sleeping well. They're not losing any sleep. So this particular individual is comfortable. They know what they're doing. It is okay for them to owe so much money. Number one, because they have the assets to back it up. Yeah, the land, very prime, very valuable land. And number two, their cash flow projection shows that the money is going to come in for sure. Now let us call that individual Japan. Yeah. Now we have another individual, they're also in the real estate business. 
They have put up also apartments, but the apartments are not in prime areas. The apartments are in Kaungware, Gorogosho, etc., etc., and maybe one or two in some middle income estates. The value of the assets is nowhere near the value of the assets of that man called Japan. Now, if you just look at debt ratio, it would appear that this other individual is better off because Japan has 100% yeah, debt to uh, uh, revenue ratio. But this other individual only has 56% debt to revenue uh, ratio. However, apart from their assets not matching what they've borrowed, this other individual, let's just call him Kenya, who's in the real estate business, does his business in a Joakali way. He has employed so many people from his rural home. Yeah, his uncle is the manager. His cousin is in charge of finances. So whenever his people visit from up country, and especially because he has got political ambitions, yeah, he wants to vie for governor in, the, in 2022, whenever people come from up country, they are sent to this cousin to collect money. And the sole source of funds of this guy called Kenya is this real estate business is doing. Therefore, the money definitely comes from his business. There is also corruption going on. Yeah, because his uncle is embezzling funds. How do you know this? Because he's putting up a palatial home in the rural area. And when you try and match his salary yeah, from this business to that palatial home, it doesn't make sense. Therefore, it's obvious he's stealing money from uh, the company. So when you consider the fact that this individual called Kenya only has a debt, uh, debt to revenue ratio of 56% compared to Japan's 100%, however his assets don't match, there's corruption going on, then you realize Kenya is in serious trouble, even with their 56% debt to revenue ratio. Folks, that is the position in which Kenya is in today. And there's plenty of evidence yeah, to suggest that we're in serious trouble financially. In my view, the president should have been totally honest. Even if we're going to continue to borrow, we should do so very, very cautiously. The president should have admitted that we have a very big problem in our hands. Now, politicians the world over are very evil. Why are they evil? Because, for instance, in the US, Republicans always drown the country in heavy debt. And their thinking makes sense, yeah, because you're not going to be in office forever. So let me incur this debt while I'm in office. It will be somebody else's problem. Let me survive while I'm in office, yeah, but it, it, this debt which is mounting up, this debt which I'll use to please the voters, yeah, to have a good legacy, will be somebody else's problem, not mine. After all, I'm going to leave the office in two or three years' time. Now, that is typical political thinking. Yeah, we can't uh, nail it down to one individual. All over the world, that's how politicians think. However, in the case of Kenya, this is extremely lethal and dangerous thinking for a young nation at this particular time. The consequences and repercussions <laughs> could be mind-boggling. The good book says, debt is a bottomless pit. That is not a deep pit. That is a pit that has no bottom. And with our apartments in Gorogosho, they will not pay fast enough yeah, to be able to enable us to uh, repay the debts. And the SGR is a very good example of putting up apartments in Gorogosho. The funds used for the SGR would have been put to much better use and much more productive use. Had we just upgraded our old railway line, and then use the remaining funds, for instance, to build an underground subway joining the north coast to the south coast in Mombasa. That would have opened up the north coast considerably yeah, for trade, especially with the neighboring Tanzania. Not to mention the very obvious impact it would have had on our tourism. Because a tourist lands on the south coast and getting to the north coast is such a big headache. It's such a logistical nightmare that they end up not visiting. That's lost revenue. Many tourists landing on the north coast, yeah, because they've never been to Kenya before, suddenly realize that they wouldn't mind visiting the south coast and they have a few hours or a day to spare. Yeah, and therefore, with such an investment, it would have been very easy for them to make their way to the south coast, yeah, spend more money there, 
yeah, benefit the people of that area and vice versa. That would have been a much more viable investment. Yeah, That would have been moving away from Korogosho, the SGR, to making a prime investment in a prime piece of land along thicker road, yeah, right next to a bypass that is developing, you know, an area that is opening up. The kind of revenues and returns you get from there are much higher. So in conclusion, this was a good interview. However, everything starts and ends with cash in your pocket. Even for a country, your finances are even much more important than national security. Because the truth will never change. And the truth is, a country that is in debt is a country that is a colony of those to those who it owes money. Until next time, this is Chris Kumekuja. Music